Greetings. Uh, so nice to have you all join us today for the last session of the Perspectives on Pastoralism Film Festival. We hope that you've enjoyed the last three sessions and we're delighted to be able to share this last one with you, focusing on global perspectives on pastoralism with films from Mongolia, from India, um, so that you'll be able to get some other uh, insights and also look at places for solidarity between pastoralists in different parts of the world, as well as Ireland, for example. Um, so we're really broadening out and looking at how there's an international movement of pastoralists who are um, who are working together to um, promote space for recognition of pastoralism as a mode of food production and also um, having more rights for mobility and looking at the issues of communal rights of land, all of these different things that are happening. So this film festival has been organized by the Coalition of European Lobbies for Eastern African Pastoralism. Um, and it's a group of a coalition of both European and African nonprofit organizations, research institutes, and also community groups of pastoralists who work together um, to promote these different issues, such as having a, a, a coherent action plan for uh, recognizing pastoralism at the European Union, but also lobbying the African Union, for example, for having uh, more coherence of, with the policies with regards to pastoralism. As we know, if we've heard in different sessions, more than 54% of the Earth's surface is rangeland, and it is pastoralists who are the people who have the expertise and knowledge who are creating meat, milk and textiles in those landscapes without high inputs. So I, without further ado, I'd like to allow for the films now. And before we do, I just wanna give you a reminder that there's a Q&A on the HOVA app and um, we will do our best to answer all of the questions that are posted in the session. Today's speaker, together with myself, is Dr. Anne Watersbeyer, um, and she's been working across the world um, in Niger, in Nigeria, and has um, co-founded the Prolanova Network for Innovation. So grassroots innovation from the bottom up. So we'll hear more about all of that um, in, after the films. So. On about 40% of land on Earth, rainfall is highly unpredictable. Where and when crops and pasture will be able to grow can change from one year to the next. Food production systems that depend on predictability struggle to control these natural environments, even with costly investments. This option was never truly sustainable, and with global climate change is meeting its limits. But depending on predictability is a choice. It does not need to be that way. Highly variable natural environments actually offer opportunities for food production when producers specialize in being in the right place at the right time. Pastoralists are such producers. They specialize in making sustainable use of highly variable environments to produce food. By managing their animals' grazing itineraries to match the changing opportunities in their landscape, they can keep their herds in a relatively stable condition. They track beneficial combinations of forage plants and highest concentrations of nutrients. This keeps their animals on the best possible diet that only a variable landscape can offer. When they have the freedom to move to the right place at the right time, pastoralists make sustainable use of the natural environment and produce organically for domestic markets and export. Conventional food production systems that choose to depend on predictability need to combat variability to control the natural environment. With climate change, 
the natural environment is becoming even more variable everywhere. This is now our common future. If we learn from pastoralists, environmental variability can become an asset. They are walking the path to sustainable food production systems in the face of climate change. By sustainably turning environmental variability into food, pastoralists are already in the future. Turbana, I am working at Grana, now, hold on. And yet, you mean that? I got an idea of the young to Grana, not to my job, to Grana, not 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 to ye <laughs> People's impression of the Burren is it's a magnificent landscape, wonderful scenery, but it is also a living landscape where farmers earn a living here. And 
the, the, the strange thing about it is, and what's come out of the Burn Life Project, is that farmers earn a living here, and the better their farmers, the better it is for the environment. The environment gains. Sometimes when uh, you think about farming, you just think about food. And food, of course, is really important. And the stuff produced by the farms of the Burn is top quality and it goes all over Europe. It's, it's, it's really good food. But what the farmers are producing by virtue of the livestock grazing these hills is probably the richest biodiversity in Northwest Europe. Because if you didn't have cattle here in wintertime, you wouldn't have the same biodiversity. When you stop grazing uh, land like this, what happens is one or two plants which are very strong, they become dominant. So some grasses and heather start to become dominant and take over. And what they do is they form a thatch of, of grass and dead plant material through which the small burn flowers can't, can't emerge. What happens then is that um, shrub species like hazel and blackthorn, they start to come in. And over time, over a short enough period of time, you can go from a beautiful orchid-rich grassland to a very interesting and lovely um, scrub or piece of woodland. Uh, the problem is scrub and woodland isn't as threatened a habitat as these orchid drift grasslands. So without farming, most of the burn revert back to the woodland from whence it originally came 6,000 years ago before farmers arrived. I suppose most farmers in Ireland come the 1st of November would be putting their cattle into a shed and they would be feeding them silage. And I suppose the, what's different about the burn, I, as far as I'm aware, it's one of the very few places in the world where we put the cattle up the mountains for the winter. My lowland, my greenland is, 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 is drying to my winterage, to my upland, and I can walk the cattle up. Others are not that lucky. They have to put them in a truck and draw them there. For us as farmers, winterage is our silage field. It's where we put the cattle for the winter to feed them. And they have what we call a dry lie up here. The, the ground is dry, limestone is dry, it's porous, the water disappears into the ground. No matter how wet it is, there will never be floods of water or water logging up here. The porous limestone takes away all that water and goes down into the underground systems. So most farmers in the burn today, and we have maybe about 500 farm families uh, working and farming this landscape, most of them keep what are called the suckler cows, which are basically cows which have a calf every year. The calf is reared until about nine or ten months and then sold, um, and that's repeated year on year. So most farmers here will be small scale, maybe 30 or 40 animals would be fairly typical. And they use the barn then for what we call winter grazing or winterage. So every winter around now, um, the cattle go up onto the hills, they forage the rough grasslands, drink the calcium rich water and lie out in the uh, dry limestone and then are taken back off to winterages uh, in spring. So in April and May, when we have spring grass down the lowland fields, the cattle are moved back down. So that's how they really operate here. It's a livestock based system. It's all grass based as well. Uh, summertime in the lowlands, wintertime in the mountains, which is kind of weird when you think about it. It's different from most parts of Europe in that regard. the local music bands with their concerts uh, then we have the, the whole day the handcraft market and at about midday today the cows will come from the from the huts down to the valley and they walk here through the village <laughs> Uh, were a hat decoration with mostly religious figures and uh, fresh flowers and also colorful bands. But if something happened on the hut during the summer, um, the cows uh, have a, only a black tie. If a cow was dead or a member of the family died during the summer, they only wear the black tie. Since 
Yes, we have farmers in the Duro. Um, there are also huts in the mountains, up in the mountains, where the farmers bring their cows during the summer time because of the fresh grass. And they stay there for the whole summer. Um, the farmers go up about in uh, June, uh, when the snow is away from the mountains and they stay there the whole summer and um, we all um, take part and celebrate that the farmers come back to the valley. Normally, right in Alpachtal has about 2,500 inhabitants, and today, yeah, I think we are about 7,000 people who visit the Almatrip, and um, they come from everywhere, from many people from fr uh, France, but also German and from Netherlands. We also have American people here, and yeah, from all over the world. Well, there's a practice known as transhumance, which basically accounts for the movement of, of livestock and, and their owners uh, uh, to avail of seasonal grazing. And obviously in most parts of Europe, uh, there's amazing cañadas or cattle routes uh, via which cattle were brought onto the hills, usually in summertime when the hills were le less cold and there's better growth on them. But in the burn, we kind of do the opposite. Uh, we take the cattle to the hills in wintertime and the reason why we think that practice, that kind of reverse transhumanist practice developed here is because probably of the lack of water here in summertime. During the Winter's Festival every year, we, we try to try to celebrate this really important tradition and thank farmers for their contribution, uh, I guess, uh, uh, to, to society, uh, managing this wonderful landscape. And we do it in a very authentic way uh, by um, reenacting a cattle drove. So we have a farmer, uh, Timmy Lanand is here, who's farming on Abbey Hill. So Timmy's going to take his herd from New Quay and across an old green road onto uh, the edges of Abbey Hill, where the cattle will spend the winter time. So the lovely thing about this is the farmer invites the broader community, local and visiting community, to join them on the cattle drove and share some stories about farming. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank on your behalf the Lenan family for making the cattle available and uh, allowing us to help them to do what 700 odd farmers will do this month, put the cattle out onto the, onto the mountain. So it's a very old tradition and it's amazing to think that you're walking a walk that cattle walked 5,000 years ago up onto a winter and that the same thing has happened every year since. <laughs> we celebrate the Winter's Festival every year around uh, Halloween, or as, as it was uh, and still is known, uh, Samhain. And that is very much uh, an inflection point, I guess, in the farming year. It's when, you know, the summer uh, uh, pastures had been grazed and the winter fodder had been saved, when the cattle were starting, the cows were starting to go dry. So farmers are starting to prepare for the winter ahead. And for us, it's a way of telling the world, like, these traditions are still out there, but we need to cherish and value them, and we need to hang on to them, because what they deliver to, in terms of our culture is so, so important.
The Raika people have been herding camels here in Rajasthan for centuries. Raika tradition holds that Lord Shiva created their caste specifically so they could look after camels. But times have changed. Their traditional way of life is now under threat. Mechanized farming has long been able to do much of the work that camels once did. So their market value has dropped sharply. The last 30 years have seen the camel population in Rajasthan shrink dramatically. He. Banwalal Raika says his father used to have twice as many camels as he does. Our traditions have been handed down for generations. They mean a lot to us. But how can we uphold our traditions when we have no income and young people have to leave for the cities to make a living? My children go to school. That costs me a lot every month. If we can no longer make a living with our camels, how are we going to survive? Ilza Kula Rolafsson is an ethnologist and veterinarian. Together with Hanwant Singh Rator, she set up an organization that helps camel herders sustain their livelihood. It's an advocacy group for Rika and their camels, and also raises awareness that the animals play a crucial role protecting the environment. Camel grazing helps tree conservation in many ways. A lot of trees can only germinate with the help of ruminants that chew their cud. It's a natural cycle. Humans, camels, the biotope, and the production of quality foodstuffs. Camels are the only animals that eat Indian globe thistle. These short, spiky plants are a nightmare for farmers. Without the camels, the plant would proliferate all over the fields and choke the crops. Camels graze by breaking off a few branches, chewing a few leaves and moving on. It's a grazing practice that encourages regeneration. The camels need large browsing areas and can cover 10 kilometers a day. But changes to agriculture mean that pasture land is in short supply. Hanwant Singh Rator has been working with camel herders for nearly three decades. In the past, Anji Kidani was a thriving village. Locals own some 3,000 camels between them. But now many locals have since switched to buffalo herding. It's more profitable. Young generation, they also don't want. So we have a very bad condition of the camels and bad situation. If you like in the next, next five years, you do, can't see any camels in, uh, on the road or anywhere because Nobody wants. If camels disappear from the roads of Rajasthan, traditional Rika culture could also disappear, and with it, their expertise in agro-pastoral herding practices. Once a year, bull calves are sold at camel markets. For centuries, this has been Rika's main source of income. They keep the cows for breeding. Camel milk is highly nutritious and a staple of the Rika diet. They used to say selling camel milk is like selling your children, but that's changing too. Now, every morning, Banwalal Rika takes camel milk to a dairy founded three years ago by Ilza Kula Rolefson's NGO. <laughs> I was about to give up. I'd sold my camels. But then the organization began selling camel milk. So I got my herd back. Now I can feed my family with what I earn selling camel milk. If the organization stopped selling milk tomorrow, I'd have to sell the herd again. Last year, he even bought more camels, doubling his herd's milk production. 
the dairy has also turned around Talaram Raika's fortunes. When he was a boy, his family sent him to the city to earn a living. He spent 15 years toiling in restaurants, hotels and tea shops. I worked in the city for years and for less money than I'm earning here. I started in the dairy two months ago. I know a lot about camel milk. I'm very happy working here. I hope the dairy continues to do well. Camels have a varied diet, eating 36 different types of plants known for their medicinal properties. So their milk is believed to have many health benefits. But for now, the Camel Charisma micro dairy still isn't selling as much as it could. It's operating at just a third of its capacity. It needs more buyers. At the moment, we have only about six families supplying us. But there's a huge amount of interest. We get calls every day from Raika asking if we can buy their milk. So it's a big concern. We've seen that Raika, who can earn a living selling their milk, are able to keep their camels. Surplus milk is turned into soap, a product that sells well. Another step towards ensuring the Raika an income. Further products that have been developed include textiles made from camel hair. This paper is made from camel dung. But the biggest challenge is finding customers. Tourists sometimes visit and sample the local camel milk. Elsa Köhler Rolofsson takes the opportunity to raise awareness of Raika culture and the threat it faces. On a global level, the UN has recognized the importance of nomadic agropastoralism. So we're moving in the right direction. But the question is, can we help before time runs out? To preserve their herds, the Riker need to make a living. 30 years ago, there were one million camels in Rajasthan. Today, it's just a fifth that. Nearly all the herders are now old. If they aren't joined by a younger generation, this traditional way of life will soon be lost. The <laughs> Uncle, <laughs> 
फिर वो दिस्ते जी फिर बैग से कूद सादिम ने था सोच ये ठीक जो फिर तीन मंथ ترجمة <تصفيق> Тэгэхээр тэр чинь янз янзан айл 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 цаа чинь тэ янз янзан цаа тэ байж уу ажил одоо тухайлын тува өндөстөн эч одоо өөр багаас над наш нэхээс гарахаас нь хэлэл хаж удаа төрхөлж мал жил байх байдаг юм тэнцэр давар гэрүүлэ гэж өөрчгөд гэж уулцуулах тал би Тэгэхээр <laughs> Тэгэхээр <laughs> ولكن Одоо мөнгөдөр бол буян заяач гэдэг. Тэр нэг заавал авч байдаг. Нэр дэн уран дээр нь яг энэ тэнгэрийн бора сайл хоёр л хүн. Өөр юм бол нэр дэн уран дээр нь гарв. Нас яг ийм тийм гэд нэг нэг гэд гэд айлуулж яардаг бол байхгүй. Аатан таг хазгар газрын гэрэ хийж өгдөг. Тийм ч учраас одоо энэ тайгийн нь уудваг л ан гэрэ тэр ямар нэг юмтай чин 
हर छह मुगल तक तो सब तक Zaten o dosunda ben yurtmur gittik. Тэгэд Tercih, tanrı kol tağın asıl. Dördün hed, dördün hedik dere tanrı uçtuk tağım hed. Neden tağı olmuş? Bu ha hun basma kuan için. Zaman ağaç her sinir, bayındalar. Hun bak
looks as though I'm like, okay, she's got it. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it was a really uh, great to see the pastoralism in different continents of the world, Africa, Europe, Asia, and I would like to take a moment also to acknowledge the audience. Um, at looking at the chat, we have greetings, shout outs from Congo, Benin, Sierra Leone, Gabon, Ghana, Togo. So really pleased to have you all with us this evening and um, uh, go ahead and put questions in the Q&A and we will work to address them. Uh, so it's uh, Dr. Ann Watersbear and I are here and she and I have been working on this film festival since 2019 actually mm -hmm. and really worked hard to bring together a collection of films that we thought would speak as much as possible from the perspective of the pastoralists themselves to show the challenges, to show the joys, to show the complexity of life so it's not just um, pastoralists that need to be saved from drought or pastoralists that are overgrazing, but these are real people who have real challenges and real life histories and life struggles. And uh, we really wish that Lupa Pius could be with us this, e this evening. Um, mm -hmm. He himself is a pastoralist from the Karamoja region in Uganda with the Dynamic Agropastoralist Development Association in Uganda. Um, but unfortunately, due to current few restrictions, he wasn't able to get to the place where he would have had the internet connection to be able to join us. So unfortunately, he's not here, but we'll do our best to, to share as much as we can about pastoralism. And Anne has been really working hard for a long time with different international networks. So she has a wealth of knowledge on this topic uh, and also worked recently on the Global Rangelands Atlas as well and the GAP report that was going through and now also the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralism. So I'd like to pass the torch on to you, Anne, um, if you could speak about your experiences of doing this kind of solidarity work across international borders. Thank you. Thank you, Margareta. Uh, yes, uh, it's the kind of work that I've been doing for quite a long time. I've been involved with pastoralism since oh, the 1980s. And uh, now I'm retired from research work, but I'm still very much involved in networking. And uh, particularly in CELEP, uh, you introduced CELEP, the Coalition of European Lobbies, Eastern African Pastoralism. And uh, in CELEP, uh, we've really discovered how important it is that uh, different organizations in Europe, those are the ones that started CELEP, organizations in Europe that were working on pastoralists with, uh, on pastoralism with pastoralists, uh, pastoral development, and realizing that uh, they could have more influence on the framework conditions for development work uh, in pastoral areas if they worked, if we worked together and uh, brought our voices together in trying to influence policies in Europe about how pastoral development is being done in Africa. And of course, for that, we really need to have very, very close collaboration with the pastoralist organizations and the research and development organizations in Eastern Africa. And we've found through this collaboration and this sharing between the European organizations and the Eastern African organizations. We've gained much more information on both sides. Uh, we found common issues across uh, countries, even in Europe, pastoralism in Europe. And um, we gained a deeper understanding of the importance of pastoralism. And to do this kind of work, we've really found we can support each other in lobbying, in advocacy to create favorable conditions for pastoralists in Europe and in Africa. And we really found that the, working together with the organizations in Africa has actually helped us to strengthen our voice in Europe 
with the European Union, a European Parliament, but also in our countries. And we hope, I think uh, if Lupo were here, he could say something about this. We have uh, helped, we've tried to help to strengthen the voices in Africa. And it's very important for us that the advocacy, the lobbying work that is being done in Africa, in the different countries in Eastern Africa, in Africa as a whole, is being done by organizations in Africa, pastoralist organizations and organizations that are supporting pastoralists. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, that's really, it's great to have a bit more insight on the history of how CELUP formed and also how it has evolved over the years to really put forward the voice of pastoralists in their own national context. As we've seen from the films, uh, I think especially in session three, the one that was late earlier this afternoon, that even within the national context, the, the situation in terms of the power dynamics of pastoralists vis-a-vis -vis those who are in power in the capitals, those who are in, in making decisions about licensing for mining, which we saw in session one, yeah. mm -hmm. um, in undermining uh, Karamoja, mm -hmm. um, and who's giving the contracts to the foreign investors coming in for the game ranching in Olosho in Tanzania, who's give, putting out the um, calls for the the dams that are being constructed and completely changing the flooding mm -hmm. and the that the agro pastoralists in southern Omo are doing it's like the people who are making those decisions are not the pastoralists mm -hmm. and yeah as we saw in the film in the Turkana it's like the man who was speaking was very clear he said let us manage these lands like this is mm -hmm. yeah yes yeah no, it is extremely important that the, the voices of pastoralist, pastoralist organizations are more strongly heard. And I think we can contribute to that. We can, but I mean, they really need to take the, uh, to take the lead. Huh? And it's, it's actually uh, encouraging to see how, how this is happening. As I said, I've been working with pastoralists and on pastoral issues for you know, 40 years or more. And there is a change. Uh, there is much more um, active, activism and action uh, uh, by pastoralist groups than there was back when, when I started working with them. Yeah, that's and uh, that brings me to my next question for you, which is about the International Year for Rangelands and Pastoralism. So can you tell us more about how that has evolved over the years with um, the different groups? Because I the website itself, I, re I really recommend it to everyone in the audience. It has uh, video clips and photography. Um, from pastoralists in South America, um, in Asia, all over the world. So perhaps you could speak more about how that momentum is building for the year uh, um, that was proposed for 2026. Well, it's, it has been a long time uh, in the making, uh, several years actually. And uh, the Mongolian government then uh, put the proposal to the FAO, I think that was back in, uh, 2019 or even 2018, but there was a lot of activity even going on before that. And uh, this uh, international support group uh, with regional support groups in all of the regions of the world have been trying to generate uh, awareness about the International Year for Rangelands and Pastoralists and have been trying to get countries to come on board to support the Mongolian government's proposal which was originally made to FAO, the Committee on Agriculture, where it was passed, but it was agreed. And uh, now it's coming up uh, in the United Nations General Assembly in uh, September in New York. And uh, there we need to get as much support as possible, support from government organizations, uh, from governments, but also support from non-governmental organizations, research organizations. We're trying to collect as many letters of support as possible. And I mean, the whole thing with this global, uh, with this um, international year is that we really want to generate 
a, a much, much better understanding worldwide of the importance of rangelands and the importance of pastoralists uh, for, for healthy ecosystems, uh, for food security, uh, for yeah, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, and also for the rural economies, the contribution of pastoralists to the rural economies in, or the national economies indeed in the different countries to make people much, much more aware of that. And uh, yeah, we have, uh, as you mentioned, we've created this website, which we call the online booth because of COVID, we couldn't be physically at these various FAO meetings where this was being discussed. So we had to find some other way to bring pastoralist voices and the voices of other organizations uh, to the people in FAO, in the different, uh, the council and the conference and, and now to the people uh, that will be voting on this in September uh, in New York. And uh, yeah, take a look at, at the website. I hope you've put the, the link there. Have you, Margareta? I can't see it from here because <laughs> I'm yeah. on another platform. Uh, yes, but, so uh, I, I did post the IYRP.info uh, yeah. link in the chat for this session right now. So anyone in the yeah. audience that wants to follow up with that, that's a great way to yeah. do it. And um, yeah, I also I remember some of the stories that you were telling about how the momentum for getting these things passed, how also like the German Shepherds Association was really um, instrumental in getting the yeah. um, the German support for the international year on board. And so right now, as you're saying, it's been passed by the FAO and we're waiting yeah. for September. So for anyone out there in the audience, if you can be part of getting one of those letters from your organization to support the IYRP, you're welcome to do that. Um, if there's any um, capacity that you have for lobbying your government to su support it as well, please do that. Um, it brings me to other advocacy issues, um, which maybe I Anne, should mention can... one point, yep. Margaret, if people yes. want to do that, they should actually get in touch with me, you can give me uh, you can give my email address. And I can then give the names of the people in the regional uh, groupings, give the names of the people to whom the letter should be sent. And so, so that we get as much support as possible for this international year. Great. I'm doing that as we speak. Okay, so. that's great. <laughs> Good, done. So the audience uh, has that at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue in terms of lobbying for pastoralism right now um, that's on the table is looking at this action plan at the European level for pastoralism. Um, so if you could tell us a bit more about what's happening. It's, I know it's something that's been um, in dialogue for a long, long time, but what are the prospects of it actually being passed well, actually, uh, as far as I know, the action plan as such doesn't really exist yet. There's a call for this action plan. And that's uh, something that we have been calling for for some time as CELEP and trying to convince people in the uh, European Parliament, uh, European Union, and uh, working through various bodies uh, at the European level. And we are hoping uh, that uh, such an action plan will eventually will be developed, but I, I, I don't think it's there yet. And it's um, probably take a long time still in the making, but that's part of our advocacy activities to, to make sure that it does happen. Thank you. Yeah, so let's hope that that can be put forward. There'll be some events supporting that initiative in the in the coming weeks as yeah. well, um, including the Yolda initiative as well. So just looking at the different international networking that's important for supporting pastoralism. And again, we'll look at like, why is this important? So when like reviewing some of the themes that came up in the films, we, we have the issue of how landscapes can benefit from, from grazing. And I can speak to that, um, the region in Germany where I live right now, which is not too far from where Anne is actually in Northern Hessen, um, or you're slightly a different area, but still cent central Germany for the rest of you. Um, mm -hmm. 
but there are shepherds who are actually paid to graze sheep in the in the local hills here because of the way it influences the composition of vegetation so to in our last minutes i want to actually um look at the question oh we have more questions now good um mm -hmm. about the issue about variability so in the chat or in one of the sub questions someone had said what kinds of variability are we looking at is it just drought and non-drought and so i would like to add that the variability is also in the plant composition so it's like as uh, they were saying in the film in cattle drove they're saying you know the like when you stop grazing, some plants will become dominant. And that's also what the man in the Turkana film was saying. He's like, when we are grazing, we are preserving the rangeland. When we stop grazing, it's drought that's the, the enemy here that's creating damage to the rangeland. But it's not the grazing, because when we have grazed enough in an area, we move on again with the mobility. And also in preserving Rajasthan's camel herds, when they were talking about the globe thistle cactus globe thistle and how that's that's a plant that the camels selectively actually eat and that it really keeps it from being invasive and crowding out other other vegetation and so i think that that's something that gets lost when people are talking about methane production and they're talking about overgrazing and how you know this type, this mode of food production can't con continue these are things that are being completely overlooked and mm -hmm. so i'm really glad that these films were able to bring it um, to the to the awareness of more people mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. And so when those action plans get put into place, I think the important things are really the food sovereignty in terms of having pastoralists really taking the lead with management and stewardship of a lot of these landscapes. And then looking at the benefits of the grazing and how to support pastoralists to do the grazing in a more sustainable way. And so that could include different kinds of benefits for really focusing on these types of governance, um, communal governance in different areas and keeping a balance between these different elements. Yes, but I think there's actually within Europe, there's much more recognition of the, uh, of the contribution of pastoralism, of uh, grazing, of herding uh, to uh, in, environmental services, uh, things like carbon sequestration, uh, biodiversity conservation. Uh, there's uh, yeah, basically the protection of ecosystems that you were talking about, Margareta. Uh, there's a more consciousness, consciousness of that in Europe. And that's why, as you mentioned, there's more support for pastoralists, um, subsidies, payments that they have for uh, stewarding the ecosystems huh? and uh, that's something which has not been so recognized thus far in most of the other countries of the world where uh, regions of the world where pastoralism is being practiced mm. thank you so we have a question here from laureen ongesa um, talking about what are the reasons behind pastoralism being considered unsustainable livelihood system to the extent where some governments invest more in other sectors, leaving out pastoralism as a sector. And I think right now with this issue on uh, vegetate, like different types of vegetation and landscape preservation that we've um, addressed some of those things, like how there are actual payments in Europe for it. And that would be something that would, I think, benefit pastoralists in other areas. And I think that um, in some of these areas where they're saying, OK, we need to have more development money going towards pastoralist er areas just for increasing the marketization of the animals. But I think looking at these other ecological benefits of the grazing and, do, and how to do it in a balanced way, that that could also be something that would be put on the conversation in other regions as well. So that could be but, beneficial. But one of the reasons, actually, why uh, there's not so much support for pastoralism and they're considered, uh, yeah, marginal and sort of even destructive, is because a lot of the the lawmakers, even from the times back in the colonial times in Africa, I'm talking about, and now uh, the people that are making policies and laws in Africa, have a different way of thinking. They have a, a 
um, a sedentary way of thinking. And they have a way of thinking that everything has to be controlled and uh, everything has to be average and the same. Whereas pastoralists have a quite a different way of thinking. They see all of the variation and all of the opportunities that are offered in different places at different times, like you saw in that short animated film at the beginning. But that's quite a different way of thinking than most policymakers. And it is really a big leap for these people to recognize what the opportunities are in this type of landscape in which most pastoralism is being practiced. And as it has been emphasized by several people and in the films as well, is uh, actually food uh, and other products are being produced in a very natural way with very few external inputs. It's really working with nature. And that is something that a lot of people throughout the world, including policymakers, uh, have not, um, they've lost that connection. Thank you. So I think we only have, we're very short on time. I think we can only look at one last question, which is how did the COVID-19 impact pastoralist communities? Yeah, well, it's a shame in a way, but it is a shame in any case that uh, uh, Lupe isn't here because he actually was the co-author of an article on the impact of COVID-19 on the pastorals in Eastern Africa. And uh, actually they found that uh, because of the low population densities, which is common in, in pastoral areas, that there was actually not so much transmission. There wasn't such a big problem, but there were problems in some of the markets or population centers where you know, people are gathering. And that was sort of where the focus uh, should be on uh, trying to prevent transmission. But the biggest effects of COVID uh, were actually the, the secondary effects, uh, the, the lockdown, the closing of the borders, uh, not being able to move the animals, whether it be for grazing or for marketing. Uh, and uh, that was in Eastern Africa. And uh, in Mongolia, it was actually quite similar as far as the closure of the borders concerned. They couldn't um, sell, uh, for example, there was a study made by in uh, Oxford, um, of Oxford University, there was a study made of, of the impact. And they actually found that although there was the uh, closure of the borders so that they couldn't sell, for example, the Kashmir, and although there were the closing of the schools, that some of many of the pastoralists actually welcomed that because it was a chance for the kids, for the children, to gain more knowledge about the pastoralist uh, traditions. Normally, they were off in boarding school. Now they were at home and involved in, in pastoralism. And uh, they also, uh, because the, the Mongolian government started very, very early with good communication about COVID, uh, there's actually at the time that the study was made, uh, 2021, there was no case of uh, COVID among the pastorals. Thank you so much, Anne, for discussing that last point. Unfortunately, we have to close the session. Um, we've come to the end, so I just want to put out a last shout out for films. Um, if anyone in the audience, if you've made a film, if you know someone who's made a film, or if you come across a film in some context, you could encourage the filmmaker as well to submit for the second edition of the Perspectives on Pastoralism Film Festival. In this next um, edition, we have more co-directors, including uh, Hussein Vario from Kenya and Kedi Bon Chiu from South Thank Africa. As well, and also Lupa Pios, who couldn't be with us uh, today from Uganda. So we'll have, and also Anthony Denayer uh, from Belgium, who's with Veterinarians Without Borders, and he's also been really helpful and supportive with getting these sessions organized. So, yeah, I'm glad that we could have this time together. Thank you to everyone in the audience for your attention. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you, Anne, and have a good night, everyone.